everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Beth Folsom, and I am the program manager here at Cambridge. Um, and before we begin, I want to acknowledge that our headquarters, the Hooper Lee Nichols House, sits on the traditional land of the Massachusetts people. So welcome to our fall conversation. I'd like to start by um, asking you if you haven't already, if you're coming in late, um, to just type in the chat where you are from, your name and where you're um, coming to us from. And if you're not coming to us from Cambridge, if you have a Cambridge connection, we would love to hear about that as well. Um, a reminder that you can use the chat box to ask questions throughout the program. And um, we'll certainly get to those as many as possible um, at the end after our speakers um, have made their presentations. And History Cambridge, Cambridge 7 and the Boston Marriott Cambridge for their generous support of tonight's program. And I'd like to extend a over to our website, which is historycambridge.org and click on the support button at the top of the page. You can also sign up to receive our e-news so you don't miss out on great future events like these. And a reminder that tonight's event is free, but donations are welcome. And a big thank you to many of you who made the donation. We really appreciate it. And tomorrow we will be receiving a survey um, asking how you liked the program. Please do fill it out. We love to learn. Uh, we love to get feedback. We learn something from every program that we do. And we want to make sure that we're giving you the best, um, the most interesting, the most uh, compelling and informative programs possible. So please fill out our survey and help us to do that for you. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening, Dr. Mary Corky White is a food anthropologist at Boston University whose area of focus is Japan, but who eats everything. She wrote this just so you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not telling on her, she's telling on herself. She has been conducting research in Japan since the early 1960s, has published books on family and social policy, on internationalization in Japanese organizations, and many more, including a recent book on coffee and urban spaces in Japan. Currently, she is working on a book on food workers, industrial and artisanal and everything else in Japan and has published two cookbooks. She is about to finish a world history of food book with her son as well, and she can't wait to get back to Japan. Stephen Chen is Chef Joyce Chen's youngest son and has been involved with her businesses since the age of eight, helping pack duck sauce and hot mustard in small takeout containers. Currently, he is the owner of Joyce Chen Foods, which produces and sells Joyce Chen sauces, oils, and frozen Peking ravioli, a term that she coined in the Boston area in 1958 in area supermarkets. Dr. Megan Elias is director of the gastronomy program at Boston University and author of five books about food history. And Gus Rankator is a Cambridge food connoisseur and the co-founder of Toscanini's, the Cambridge-based sh shop that the New York Times says makes, quote, the best ice cream in the world. And I would happen to agree with that. So thank you all so much. Um, is it okay if we go in the order that I introduced you with um, Corky going first? Are you okay with that, Corky? Sure, absolutely. All right, take it away. Beth, thank you so much for including me, and what a great group. I look forward to hearing from other people, but put up with me for a few minutes, and then we'll get some other interesting stories. Um, so th thank you very much. Um, I've, I've been asked to kind of weave my personal history in Cambridge with the culinary history of Cambridge, but also because I teach Boston and Cambridge through food, I think my remarks will not as much be about the theme of mending, but it's about the divisions and the separations and their history, um, the ways in which we didn't get together uh, at a multicultural table in, in my historical experience. Um, perhaps we can get that together in the discussion later, especially now as we move across circles and share more and travel within Cambridge and outside Cambridge. So um, a Cambridge I teach starts with the Cambridge I couldn't have known because it was the early you know, 1900s um, as a set apart, but still a Boston influenced enclave. 
And the Cambridge I experienced um, myself doesn't begin until the mid 20th century, but there were still echoes then of the earlier Boston Brahmin culture in Cambridge and of immigrant cultures as well. Um, so some of that earlier history is still alive, perhaps, well, was anyway. So I'm interested in the eating geographies of Cambridge, um, time and place, especially place, and the economics and culture of eating that kept changing. Um, I'm from the Midwest. I, we moved here in 1953 when I was 12. Um, and um, so I'm Minnesotan and Chicagoan. Um, so uh, always kind of seeing it from the outside. Um, um, I was in elementary school when we moved here and I seem to be always in Harvard Square, the way people used to see it as a magnet. Um, but then it was just local people. It wasn't tourists and it wasn't suburban teens. Uh, there wasn't the pit. Um, but by the late 1950s, I got into coffee and Harvard Square was coffee house heaven. That was a location that is in a sense a food location. So that's where I lived, the coffee houses, um, starting in about 1955. Uh, coffee houses were political spaces. And in high school, I used to kind of, I was very pretentious. I used to wear a black turtleneck sweater and go to the coffee houses with eye makeup, but no lipstick. And I carried around Allen Ginsberg's Howl and the Communist Manifesto to signal my coolness. Uh, there were cafes that were quite wonderful. The Cafe Mozart, Tullo's, um, 57 Mount Auburn, and uh, much later others like the Pamplona. Um, but it was never about the coffee, which stank. It was burned urn coffee. Um, but it was about the spaces and the people. And a lot of food places in Cambridge were about the place itself because after all, it was really not so much about food itself. Um, being a regular though in these coffee houses, I wrote both my undergraduate and my graduate theses in the Pamplona, the table at the back right. Um, it, uh, so sadly, it's a space that's gone. Coffee houses were also about smoking. And you will, some of you remember that smoking took place in restaurants as well as coffee houses. And I didn't smoke, but pretentious as I was, I carried around a pack of Balkan Sobranis or a pack of Golwas in order that somebody asking me for a cigarette would think I was kind of cool. Um, what about the food? Um, the late 50s and early 60s, time? Was I muted all that time? No, I wasn't. Okay, I was so just, just no. That was just a technical, last technical. Oh. Thanks. Okay, now we're okay. All right. Um, so the food again. Um, what was the Boston area like then? Well, it was enclaved. I talked about separation and distinction. Um, people didn't eat each other's food very much it was your food and you didn't cross boundaries as much unless they were rich people and then their food might've been French. Um, and people didn't move around. Our culinary geographies were really limited um, and boundaries were clearer. You knew, for example, when you entered South Boston, especially if you weren't Irish. Now backing up to well before my time again, um, Boston's big waves of immigration from the mid 19th century, of course, Irish, Jewish, um, later Italian. Um, the official goal was assimilation. One of the things I find really interesting is to look at social workers' journals from that era, the high immigration era, to see what the social workers were trying to help these families adjust, what they wanted of them. And there was one diary of a social worker that I show my class from the North End at the, in the high Italian era. Um, well, actually that was around 1880 to 1920. Um, and she's lamenting this wonderful Italian family's inability to be American. She says, 
still eating spaghetti, not yet assimilated. So, you know, the goal was you got to become as American as quickly as possible. Um, that, that was kind of the Boston goal for people coming from elsewhere. And of course, some people were not really permitted culturally to assimilate, to be considered American. Well, the food for those Brahmins was very bland and stodgy and Cambridge had that too, um, very Anglo. Um, and Boston people were not New York people. They really thought New York people were decadent and hedonistic and show-offy, and Boston was to not attend to the food. Of course, we had, on well, Saturday night was baked beans and brown bread, I think, and Friday night was fish. Um, I think there were some other customs as well that sort of set the culinary template. But this side of the river was, wasn't much more interesting. We had meatloaf, and the, you know, the things we would now call comfort food were standard food. Welsh rabbit, I don't know if anyone in the audience had Welsh, we called it Welsh rabbit. Um, and uh, places on this side of the Cambridge side of the river did start exploring, um, but only if you went into a different neighborhood. So if you went to East Cambridge, you had Portuguese and Italian food. Um, North Cambridge Irish, of course, um, odd bits of things in Inman Square, Chinese and Indian in Central Square, but that was a bit later, particularly after the immigration laws changed in 1960, um, allowing for Chinese, particularly from other parts of China, and Stephen will know all about this, not only from South China as earlier. So it diversified our understandings of what was Chinese. But when I first came to Cambridge, there were no pizza and there was no bagels. Um, that was before bagels became kind of general population, cinnamon, raisin, and other, you know, types of things. Um, the, um, the, actually, there was pizza in, on Warren Street in Cambridge early on. Warren Street off of Cambridge Street was where one whole village from Italy came, bringing their saints and their pizza. Mm -hmm. um, so you, ha you had to go to get things like that. You had to deliberately be a chow hound. Um, High-end eating in the 50s was still French. Um, and there was a place on Church Street called Chez Dreyfus, where I remember having my first tripe, and later at the Arunia in Harvard Square, the Spanish version. Now, Cambridge was a, a three-class city, really. Mm -hmm. um, very prominently blue collar and industrial working class city. So there, but there was some merging of uh, the working class with students who after all, at least temporarily were not rich. They had, they had slender budgets. So that some of the meeting points for um, uh, less expensive food brought people together in interesting ways. Cafeterias like the Hayes Bickford or Albionis in Harvard Square or sandwich shops like the Tasty um, or Elsie's, um, which actually was much more student, but you could, if you could splurge on a roast beef special. So people are nostalgic for these places, but there's nostalgia for the place and not for the taste of food for the place, for the personalities behind the counters. And um, only a little later did food become the destination. Um, and that, you know, was combined in the late seven, in the seventies with a kind of revolutionary fervor for other people's food. But revolutionary asceticism among us students said, well, you know, you're not supposed to really pay attention to the food because that's not political. That's too bourgeois to be involved with the food. But you went to places like peasant stock where peasant food was all right. It was, you know, it was politically sound and expressed one's solidarity with disadvantaged persons. Peasant stock was interesting but because it had kind of one dish at a time. And that dish was invariably a kind of brown stew. So one peasant fits all food. There were some other revolutions going on, um, and I was in both um, that revolutionary stew pot, and also because 
the two JCs in my life, Stephen's mom, Julia, and Julia Child, um, and my, transformed my life completely. And my kitchen was full of Le Creuset stew pots suddenly, and learning how to bone my first turkey. This is a period that happened gradually, actually. Um, and I think that there were many more independent, experimental shops in those days too. But I think it might be interesting um, to look at what was going on when Julia Child entered um, the scene. Um, French was still elite, but she made French available to our home kitchens, even a graduate student's home kitchen. And that was extremely interesting. I was a caterer then at a place at Harvard called the Center for West European Studies. West European because the wall hadn't come down yet. So I was cooking, scared, scared, enormously scared um, be, for people who really knew food. These were Europeanists. So my strategy was, <clears throat> in, this is in the 1970s, my strategy was to cook food that they might not know. In other words, stay away from French, stay away from Italian, stay away from German and cook Latin American food or Middle Eastern food. Um, and then they wouldn't be able to compare it with something that they might know better. And that got me through. But uh, Julia was just down the block and she came to my rescue quite often. Um, I would often call her and be crying. And she always knew it was me because I was sobbing because something had gone de terribly wrong. Later on, if anyone has any questions about particular rescues, I can go into it. I don't want to take much time. But I was doing all kinds of things on the edge in those days, as many people had begun to do in the late 70s, too. Um, Boston and Cambridge were really not as cosmopolitan um, as we see them today. Um, I take my students on field trips to East Boston for Hispanic food, to Vietnamese Dorchester, um, to Armenian Watertown. <clears throat> and I tell you, I'm going to take a plug for one of my favorite cosmopolitan shops, which is called Curio. It's a spice shop on Upper Mass Ave, um, where the spices of the world are gathered, never, never before all in one room. Um, and it's a great place for creating a spice gazetteer and exploring your boundaries. Um, I would like, though, to kind of stop in, in the middle here, because I think I've already taken quite a lot of time, and um, ask people to come in later or think, put things up on the chat if you're interested. Um, um, Gus also has some culinary geographical history a little later than mine to share uh, when, when, when it's his turn. So I think he can complete the historical picture, um, I think, and I think Megan has a slideshow that looks really fascinating. So um, let me leave it there and ask for questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corky. I would love to uh, pass the microphone over to Stephen Chen. He is next on our list, and I would love for him to talk about his uh, experiences growing up in Cambridge and um, experiences with his his mom's business and um, and what that was like. So, Stephen, take it away. Oh, you're still muted, Stephen. I'm sorry. Hmm. Oh, no. Okay, here we go. There you are. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to see everyone. And yeah, I'll be very happy to share uh, my mother's history and part of my history, too. Uh, my mom came uh, from China. Uh, she left Shanghai in 1949. And she actually, her goal was to come to Cambridge and to live in Cambridge. And the reason why was because um, her friends went to Harvard and MIT. And they said that if you ever come to America, you have to be sure you live in Cambridge. And uh, actually, that was a very good choice. Uh, we lived on a, I wasn't born yet, but the uh, when they first came, they lived on Kirkland Street. 
in Cambridge. And my mom was basically a housewife uh, in China. She actually, when she was younger, she used to sell um, liability insurance to sailing ships. But cooking was always her hobby. And uh, she learned how to cook from the woman who was taking care of her. Our family, uh, <clears throat> her family did have a chef. And uh, the, uh, and the chef was going to, uh, Anyways, my grandfather's <clears throat> uh, brother was going to be uh, going to Russia for uh, political. I think he was going to be a, a envoy or some type of uh, uh, from China, and they didn't have any good Chinese food. So he took the chef, but he, the chef left his wife, and the wife who was taking care of my mother then uh, started taking the duties of cooking in the kitchen, which in turn. Uh, was putting my mother in the kitchen, and that's where she kind of oversee, you know, making different small dumplings and different items, and that's where her interest of Chinese cooking really came about. And she loved to kind of figure out dishes and figure out, you know, how do you make this and that. So she wasn't really trained as a professional chef, but she really it was really one of her hobbies. And that hobby actually extended that when she came to Cambridge, she still retained uh, connections with Chinese um, students that were going to Harvard and MIT, invite them to our house for a Chinese meal. Because at that time, <clears throat> the only place to really get some Chinese food was either Chinatown or I think there was a place on Church Street that was uh, a Chinese restaurant. Uh, and then uh, and everyone enjoyed it. It was a very sociable thing. She always mentioned that, you know, cooking is an unselfish artist. It's someone who really wants to share their art with other people. And it's unselfish because if you create an art object, you can always say, well, I like it. But, but you can't say everyone likes it. For a cooking, everyone has to like it. And that's what made her so happy. And it started with uh, us going to school. At that time, we went to uh, Buckingham. And they had their uh, Buckingham Circus. <clears throat> and all the parents were supposed to bring in some type of, you know, baked items. So my mom actually made egg rolls. And they're more of the Americanized egg rolls, but she made them and she worked all night. And she also made cookies in the shape of pumpkins. So uh, she dropped them off and then she came back later and she saw her cookies there on the table. But her egg rolls were gone. And she thought, oh, my gosh. No one liked them, or they were too embarrassed to put them out on the table. But when she got to the table, one of the parents said, you know, Mrs. Chen, those egg rolls you made, they sold out like crazy. Can you make some more? And she was so happy that she went home and made more. And this then started a situation where people were asking her about cooking. You know, how did you do this? How did you do that? So she started to actually do cooking classes in our home. And, uh, and then from there, she did the uh, Cambridge Adult Education Center, I think in 1961, she started cooking. And then she wrote a cookbook. And then someone suggested she should open a restaurant. And she opened the restaurant in Fresh Pond, uh, Concord Avenue. And it was, a, it was a, over 100 people. So at that time, it was a large Chinese restaurant. Uh, it used to be a warehouse for a um, produce, you know, fruit and vegetables wholesaler. So uh, she rented the building. Next door was a company called Reginald Beef, which sold uh, pork and beef and those types of things. But in the beginning, it was really difficult. Uh, you know, people just didn't know what Peking duck was. They didn't know mushy pork. It was all so different. And, you know, sometimes I remember my sister telling a customer complained because they were eating and they said, where's the French bread? Because in those days, a lot of Chinese restaurants serve French bread, and some of them still do. And, you know, he complained and said, you know, this is no Chinese restaurant. You don't even serve French bread. So it was really kind of a education that my mom realized she had to do. And this is where she came up with the idea of a Chinese buffet. All you can eat at one set price. <clears throat> and I think it was like, $5.95 all you could eat. So when she started the buffet, she actually thought, well, maybe she should put some things that people are familiar with. So in the beginning, she had a roast turkey and a roast ham. 
so, you know, basically a carving station. So people would look at it and say, well, you know, if I don't like the Chinese food, I could always eat the turkey and the ham. And, but then it also encouraged people to try the other dishes. And then she found out that everyone else enjoyed the new dishes. And uh, there was a time when we had the buffets, it was Tuesday, Wednesday night, our slow night. And there would be people waiting out in the parking lot just to get in to have the buffet. So, uh, you know, she realized there was an educational curve that she had to do, but, you know, I think uh, she always figured out how to overcome that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, the, the restaurant was in Cambridge. Uh, I have a picture of it, and I want to see if we can share it. Can you see it? No? Okay. Well, <laughs> anyways, it's the picture of the restaurant, uh, Joyce Chin Restaurant. She decided to call it Joyce Chin Restaurant. And, uh, you know, and it was very different because we were a Northern Chinese restaurant. A lot of other restaurants were uh, from the Canton or Southern China. And I just remember being young, going to Chinatown ordering and since we didn't speak Cantonese, she would have to order by writing the menu because the writing in Chinese is the same everywhere. And we would have to order uh, by writing down the dish. Even if it was white rice, she would have to write down the words white, white rice so people would know. Uh, then she started, uh, I'm trying to get this picture because Can you see that? No? Okay. So yeah, that was, a, you can see the, the sign that says buffet. Uh, it's kind of small, but that would be lit up every time we had the buffet. It would say buffet. And then at dinner time, it would say buffet tonight. So uh, that's how they, uh, they started it. Um, you know, then she was approached, but you know, Cambridge was a special place because there were so many students that, that were from around the world. There were people that were more exper experimental. Uh, it was really a uh, really, it was an intellectual place where people would be willing to try different foods and try different things. And it was very uh, a diverse uh, city, especially around Harvard Square, Cambridge. We lived on Alpine Street, again, near, um, near Fresh Pond, which was, uh, a lot of different people from different countries and things like that. Um, then eventually, uh, you know, she wrote her cookbook and she had her uh, television show, which was done by the same producers and director who did the, the Julia Child show. Matter of fact, the uh, set that was used was actually the Julia Child, Julia Child set. But since Julia Child is quite a tall woman, my mom was not that tall the counters were, were too high. So she had to actually wear high heels in order to work behind the counter. Uh, some people say, why high heels? Well, because she had to walk from the, the cooking stove to the dining room. It would be kind of strange for her to be at one height and then step down and be a lower height. Uh, she did uh, 23 shows. Uh, then she just kept on going on and saying, well, you know, uh, why don't we have a walk that's a flat bottom that fits on the stove? So she patented the flat bottom walk. And you can see it now. It's almost available every, everywhere. Probably everyone has one somewhere. Um, then she did uh, cooking sauces and, and just a very enterprising woman. But she always wanted to share, and that's how she shared. But also, you know, being the trends, uh, being ahead of her time, but just really sticking in there and just pushing the uh, the idea and trying to get people to try new items. And uh, Cambridge was, was a great place to do that. I don't know, is that five minutes? <laughs> Can you hear me? So sorry, technical difficulties for a second there. Let's. I don't know, did you hear everything I said? I hope. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. I just had trouble getting 
logging back on my audio. Um, thank you, Stephen. I'm sure folks are going to have a lot of questions um, and memories to share with you um, in our Q&A. Uh, I am going to hand it over for the moment to Megan Elias, and um, she's got a um, slideshow to share with us as well. So I'm going to go ahead and see. Stephen, could you uh, stop the share on your screen? That's perfect. There's Megan's. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I've just put together a couple of maps because I wanted to think about the history of Cambridge and food. Um, and you can see you can see the, the dining in Cambridge. Okay, great. Um, so this is Cambridge 100 years ago. This is, well, 101 years ago. So this is um, kind of a landscape that I wanted to think about in terms of um, where we are now and um, where we've sort of, where Cambridge started in that first phase of um, a kind of democratization of public dining. So it's really not till the early 20th century that, that sort of regular people could think about going out to eat. Um, and most of the places that they went out to eat, as you'll see in this, in this map, were really not kind of destinations for dining. They were just places to grab food. So this is, let me just minimize this here. Um, this is a picture, I believe it's from Central Square and it has the ice cream and candy sign, which I wanted to draw out especially. Um, this is just data that I've gathered from the Cambridge City directories, which are available. They're digitized and great fun to look through. Um, this is something that we, we sort of um, pay a, a lot of attention to in food history is placement. Of, of establishments. So in this Cambridge City directory from 1920, there are very few places that are, um, that are listed as restaurants. And this is actually, let me see if I can pull this map out a little. I believe there's one more place on the map. Yes, way out there, right? So um, here, here are the restaurants of Cambridge of 1920. Very, very few. Um, and we'll see in a, in a minute why, why that is. So restaurants offered, um, a certain kind of cuisine. And it was not yet the, um, the very high status French kind of food. It was a kind of amalgamation of some French techniques, some English traditions, some German stuff. A lot of the professional chefs in America in the early 20th century were actually Swiss. So they were drawing on French and German and Italian traditions. And if you can maybe see this Hamden there's an ad for the Hamden Cafe, which was one of the few restaurants in Cambridge in 1920. They offer good service and good food. So it's not, you know, not the kind of um, uh, um, language that we would expect a, a, a fancy restaurant to offer us today. Um, they, they note that they have, they do dining parties. Dining parties are served on short notice. So this tells us that it was common for people to want to dine in large groups and to sort of get the whim to do that maybe um, very suddenly. And so you can imagine people maybe who've gone out drinking who then want to have a big meal together. Uh, they, they indicate the kind of food that they have just with a few words, steaks, lobsters, broiled chicken, and seafood, a specialty. So this is telling you that there's, um, these are the things you can expect. As, as having um, a kind of uh, status markers, right? That these, these steaks, the broiled chicken, which today might not seem like a, a very special dish, but um, in 1920 was, was something um, a little kind of higher class than your regular food. And at the bottom, you, which you really probably can't see at all, it says Friedman's Yankee Jazz Orchestra every Sunday from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m., which is, is just this wonderful mixture of cultures, right? Jazz being the very new African-American art form, um, Friedman obviously being a Jewish person, and then it's a Yankee Jazz Orchestra just sort of brings in the, the, um, the, the Anglo culture of, of Cambridge at the time. So the next category of dining places that I wanted to map is the lunchrooms. There are many, many more of them than restaurants, as you can see. And you see they're really clustered around Central Square, around Harvard, and then they're sort of all over the place over here. There's quite a lot down Cambridge Street, which suggests that there were um, people working in office spaces or um, that this is an area that students would frequent. So lunchrooms are really focused on that midday meal. And that tells us that in 1920 in Cambridge, there are a lot of people who um, 
who are not going to be eating at home. And that's a really kind of a new phenomenon in the early 20th century for people to be out of the house during lunchtime. And all of these establishments are going to be serving that, that new class of diner. They're um, really interesting. The, the, the names of the proprietors are listed in the directory. And what you'll find um, in this particular moment is a lot of Greek names, a lot of Italian names, and some Armenian names already too, as well as some English names and Irish names. But the, the diversity of ownership is not really reflected in the dishes that, you're, that you see on the menus. So here's a, a teeny little ad, but I just love the... Um, the graphic and the, the term, Mr. Epicure tells you where to eat. Uh, this is an ad for Hilliard's Cafe. And here's a little group of people saying, where shall we dine? And a little arrow says, here, this is where you have to eat. That's very appealing. Um, Hilliard's says, try our hot weather specials. Shrimp salad, chicken salad, chicken salad sandwich, Epicure salad. So you see there's not a lot of variety in types of dishes. You're going to have a salad or you're going to have a sandwich. Whether we call it an Epicure salad or just a chicken salad sandwich, it's still really the same kind of thing. And they're just, um, just offering variety. There were a lot of what are called, um, at the time were called composed salads, which means something quite different now, but they were um, really salads of leftovers. So you might, you know, might serve um, chicken and then have chicken salad made from the leftovers the next day. These are very um, strategic kinds of salads. And then the third category I wanted to look at is in honor of Gus. So this is the ice cream shops and ice cream makers in Cambridge in 1920. Let me go a little bit closer. Um, and in particular, over here, there's a, there was a large ice cream factory. It took up an entire city block, the Johnson Ice Cream Factory. Here again, you see a couple near Harvard, but a lot near Central Square where Gus's establishment is now. So he's really, let's see, I'm sure he knows very much in the tradition of Cambridge ice cream makers. Um, ice cream makers and candy makers often um, were in the same establishment. They... Um, they served um, a growing population of young people who were um, out of the home on their own, um, and also of women. So by 1920, it's much more common to see middle-class women kind of out for the day um, with friends, going shopping, um, going to lectures, going to museums, um, maybe even taking classes. And the ice cream shops and, and confectionaries served as places where, where women could feel um, that it was sort of safe for them to go because if these weren't places where, where there was alcohol, where um, if a woman entered into a place with alcohol, her sort of reputation was, was suspect. So all of these, you can think of all these little blue flags as sort of safe spaces for women at, the, at that time. And I just wanted to show um, a little ad for a place called Candyland, which advertised itself as the popular palace of sweets, which seems very irresistible. Um, they specialized their special pecan rolls and then chicken bones, which were a kind of, um, a kind of confection and also molasses kisses, which we never see today, unfortunately. And then just to conclude, I wanted to show off this list of ice cream flavors. Madalena was an ice cream store in Cambridge. Um, they catered events. And there was an article in the newspaper um, talking about how many different kind, uh, different flavors they had. So this is, again, 1920. This is before Baskin-Robbins and their 39 flavors. This is 30 different kinds of ices and creams that Madalena serves. Some would be familiar to us, vanilla, strawberry, chocolate, coffee. Um, others like macaroon are less known, the Hoover bomb, um, the orange bomb, the Belgian bomb, many bombs, even a Harvard bomb and a Duchess bomb, the noisette, the tortoni, um, a Fifth Avenue bomb, there, and the Commonwealth Avenue. So all of these things that are very, um, uh, very local, you know, very specific to the to the that area. Um, it's gonna, it's more likely to draw in local customers to, or you know, to students who are celebrating the fact that they're they're in this particular place. So I would love to see if Gus could maybe bring back the Commonwealth bomb at some point. Um, and so I'll just leave it there, and, and I'm happy to ask questions, answer questions. I mean, um, about the material here. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I would love to take that natural segue um, into Gus telling us about some of his uh, Cambridge memories and his experience um, on the culinary scene um, in in Cambridge. Gus, are you? There he yeah. is. Okay, perfect. Take uh, it away. Uh, take it away. Um, one of my, I don't know, one of my strongest memories 
is being in Harvard Square um, just before we opened Toscanini's Ice Cream. And I was waiting to cross the street in front of the Harvard Coop and um, it was snowing. And I looked to my left and I looked to my right and there were people eating ice cream cones on either side of me. And I thought to myself, this may work. This could be a good place to open an ice cream store. Um, in fact, um, after moving to Boston um, to, attend Boston, to attend Boston University, I was struck by an almost comical number of ice cream stores in the city. And I was at that time standing in front of a very large Brigham's. Um, to my right was a very small store called La Spa that had um, that was briefly famous for possibly inventing frozen yogurt, a product category that's by and large disappeared. And then um, across the street was a place called Belgian Fudge that went through multiple incarnations and it was actually at Toscanini's at one point. Um, it's now a JP Licks. Further down the street at Bow and Arrow Street, there was a haagen -Dazs. And um, if you went to Brattle Square, there was Bailey's, which was a more or less authentic late 19th century ice cream store that served Sundays on metal bowls that were on saucers. Um, it's kind of very genteel place and evoked um, some bygone sense of what Cambridge might have been like when somebody's grandfather attended. Um, Toscanini's, um, I had opened Toscanini's after working at Steve's Ice Cream in Somerville. And um, I would say that there were two ice cream stores in Somerville that were also important. Um, if you go to the bottom of the Red Line Station in Davis Square, there's a timeline. And I think it begins with the glaciers retreating. But um, one of the final entries on the timeline is it says, 1973, Steve's Ice Cream opens. And I actually think that that was a meaningful date um, in the transformation of Cambridge and Somerville from cities that were characterized almost as industrial cities to post-industrial cities. And it was the beginning of Somerville's transformation into uh, a, away from a very pugnacious blue collar town to something close to a junior varsity version of Cambridge, um, which um, is an offensive concept to Somerville residents who think um, Somerville is its own wonderful place, but um, certainly Somerville changed and the change began when Steve's Ice Cream opened. Um, further, Somerville like Cambridge is divided into squares. And if you went up about a mile to Teal Square, which is close to Tufts University, there was another ice cream store there called Joey's. And um, Joey later started Bertucci's ice cream, rather started Bertucci's pizza, um, which had stores all over and um, furthered the transformation of, of Wealth Cambridge and Somerville into something much different than what they were when my father went to school in Boston after World War II. Um, yeah, I have some notes here about things I wanted to cover. Um, one of the problems, one of the aspects to remember about Cambridge and Boston and Somerville is that um, political boundaries um, are often very old and sometimes very small. Um, Cambridge, Boston itself is um, about 47 square miles, I think. Um, Cambridge is very small. Parts of, parts of Boston function as almost Cambridge neighborhoods. I used to think that North Alston was basically a neighborhood of Cambridge. It was oriented towards Cambridge. You took a bus from Union Square, Alston into Harvard Square. People tended to eat in Harvard Square more than they ever thought about going to Boston. And um, there are other neighborhoods that are like that. Um, there's this strange borderland where um, Sofa Restaurant is um, that seems to be sometimes in Watertown, sometimes in Belmont, and might actually be in Cambridge. Then um, the border of Beacon Street coming out of Inman Square going towards Porter Square um, is not even an example of one side of the street being in Somerville and one side of the street being in Cambridge. One house on one side of the street is in Somerville. The next house is in Cambridge. And when you cross the street, who knows where you are? But um, the political boundaries are sort of arbitrary and people don't always give them a great deal of attention. And so 
when you talk about um, where people in Cambridge eat, uh, um, you kind of have to acknowledge that sometimes they eat outside of Cambridge or there are places in Cambridge that are, um, well, the Kirkland Cafe um, was briefly during the golden age of disco or the golden age that was disco uh, was a place called Studley's. And um, Studley's was incredibly popular with um, young people from Somerville um, who were zealous for anything involving disco dancing. And then um, there are other examples of things like that. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. One of the things Cambridge used to have um, when we opened Toscanini's, we opened at um, the intersection of Main Street and Massachusetts Avenue in what old Cambridge residents think of as Lafayette Square. Most people um, just think that it's part of Central Square. Um, Lafayette Square, when we opened Toscanini's in 1981, still smelled sweetly of sugar factories. Um, there were candy making factories. There was a donut shop. Um, every morning when I arrived, the neighborhood had this vaguely intoxicating smell. Um, if you liked bre if you liked sweets, and I did. Um, the biggest building in the neighborhood was the Neko factory, which made these very inexpensive candies. Um, I think Neko departed for um, Revere and the building is now a billion dollar home to a European drug company. And most of the big buildings that are in the neighborhood have been transformed. There's no candy making going on anymore. And the neighborhood also has lost kind of that special atmosphere of sweetness that existed when we opened in 1981. The um, other thing about, uh, about Cambridge was as an industrial town, it had, um, it had bars that had 8 a.m. liquor licenses. And so there are even a few of those liquor licenses left in Central Square. Um, I remember being shocked that one upscale cafe actually opened at eight o'clock. But when the sugar, when the candy factories were going full tilt, if you worked a midnight shift, you might very well want to go get a beer or a shot of whiskey um, to conclude your work, work day. And so there are bars all over Cambridge um, that had very strange hours or hours that would be strange to the people who think of a bar as someplace you go after a normal work day and leave before it closes at 11 or 12 or 1 a.m. The um, Cambridge used to have thug bars. It had bars that were um, frankly hostile to almost anybody who went in. Um, I don't think it had much to do with ethnicity or race. Um, I remember going into one place, which is now a yuppie water, watering hole um, in mid Cambridge. And uh, the guy belligerently asked me, what do you want? And I said, I want something to eat and I want to drink. And he goes, oh, and he looked incredibly unhappy. Other friends had similar stories because they thought that the service I experienced was probably the high watermark of what was then called the Windsor Tap. And um, now I think it's Lord Hobo's and things are much different, much changed. The um, other thing that I was gonna discuss were um, blue collar neighborhoods. There were, and there are three that come to mind, one of which Corky already mentioned, North Cambridge, which goes from Harvard Square through Porter Square to the Arlington Line. And um, North Cambridge was once Irish and to a, an extent or, or Fringe Avenue, there was a large community of French Canadians. And uh, North Cambridge still exists as this kind of urban dormitory neighborhood. Um, it's the home to a very large percentage of Cambridge residents. It's been a power base for neighborhood interests in the city council. And um, at the other end of the city from Inman Square to Leachmere Square is a long linear neighborhood, which was of course a streetcar suburb as described by Sam Bass Warner. And um, that's the predominantly Portuguese neighborhood of East Cambridge. When I arrived in Boston, there were um, Polish churches in East Cambridge and um, East Cambridge still has kind of a small group of Italian residents that you could describe as a fighting a holding action um, as the neighborhood changes. Um, the neighborhood has been characterized as Portuguese because um, the society, what is it called? The Portuguese, um, the League of Portuguese Speakers in Massachusetts is nearby. St. Anthony's Church is a major um, center 
for religious observation. And there were um, several seafood restaurants and seafood um, shops that cater to um, people from different parts of the Portuguese diaspora. Um, East Cambridge has always had a mixture of people from the Azores, people from Cape Verde, Portugal, Portugal and recently people from Brazil. Um, most Brazilians actually ended up living in Framingham, which has far more Brazilians than any neighborhood in Cambridge or Boston. And, uh, but you still see Brazilian restaurants there. One of the things that happened illustrates an idea that people in the food, that people in the food business have, um, which is echoes an idea that urbanists have, which is that cities are always changing. Cities are, in the words of one uh, professor I had um, at McAllister College, cities are either dying or improving. They're getting better or they're getting worse. It's very rare for a city to stay the same for any length of time. And so um, people in the food business and the retail people who find homes for restaurants talk about churn. And churn doesn't just have to do with mixing things in. Churn is the constant change um, as tenants uh, open and close their restaurants. So all most of the ice cream stores that lit, that were in Cambridge in 1973 closed. And I would say they were largely replaced by coffee shops. And that was because part of the function of both groups of restaurants was a social function. Um, it was a relatively inexpensive place um, to meet with somebody or spend a little time by yourself and um, not, not drink or do anything that would diminish your capacity in a big college town to study. Um, this is something um, some friends of mine who visited really hated about Cambridge, which was that everybody was always going off to do something and then go back to study. Um, so Cambridge has like a bizarre concentration of Starbucks in Harvard Square. There's a great big two-story Starbucks right by the Harvard Square subway entrance. And I would say that functions the way American Express offices used to function. Um, it's a place to meet, meet friends. I will meet you at the big Starbucks. Um, it's a place to sit and get your bearings before you decide where you're going to go next. Um, if you go a little further down Church Street, um, there's a Starbucks that replaced the Steve's ice cream. And that Starbucks caters um, to people from the Ed School. And if you go over to Broadway, um, near what was once called the Fog, and it's now the Harvard Art Museums, um, there's a small Starbucks that mostly caters to people who work um, at the several art museums that are clustered around that part of Harvard's campus. And finally, there's another Starbucks on Massachusetts Avenue that's directly across from High Rise Bakery. And both cafes cater to this unusual mixture of Harvard Law students and Lesley College students. And um, now what, what we've recently seen in the past couple of years is an influx of poke restaurants, which I don't think anybody knew what poke was four years ago. And now there might be half a dozen to 10 poke restaurants um, in, in almost any neighborhood in Cambridge. And I'm not sure whether the poke restaurants are gonna survive. Um, and I'm certainly not sure what's gonna replace them, but they are vivid examples of the constant change that's going on in, in food ways in Cambridge. The third neighborhood I think should be mentioned is Cambridgeport, um, which, is where, which is a neighborhood south of Central Square, um, largely populated by people from the Caribbean. Many black people in Boston and Cambridge are people from quote, the islands. And so what you see there are um, places selling meat patties, barbecue, but you also see a strange um, collection of Korean churches, which have somehow um, concentrated um, in the neighborhood. Um, there is a pretty good Italian restaurant that's actually run by Albanians. Um, there is an um, Ethiopian grocery store that I think is on Magazine Street. It's a very small Ethiopian um, store. The interesting thing about Ethiopians is that they eat a bread called injera, um, which they share with um, breakaway part of Ethiopia, Eritreans. 
And it's available in many parts of Cambridge, but sold almost furtively. Um, you have to ask somebody, do you sell injera? They, they look at you like you might want to go into the back room and have a drink, and um, then they will sell you the injera. Um, that's, I think, my report about what's going on. The discussion about how people might um, come more together over hospitality is one that I find incredibly interesting. And I wanted to end with a story about a family that I thought was always strikingly hospitable. Um, Joseph and Nabil, who own the Middle East, um, a complex of rock and roll venues in Central Square, would you could not enter the Middle East without them asking you if you would like a cup of tea or um, the famous chicken sandwich, which came with a secret sauce that I never deciphered. Um, years ago, I was at a meeting of the Central Square Business Association and the conversation had turned to the difficulties of Central Square's large homeless population. And I will impolitely say that this is a challenging population um, to, for small business people in a place like Central Square. And I was listening to everybody complain about the homeless people and thinking about my own amazing stories of terrible things I'd had to deal with because of the homeless. When Joseph um, threw down a pile of papers he was reading, and he goes, this is impossible. This is terrible. Um, I tell you what I do with these people. I give them a sandwich. I give them tea. I say, eat, drink. You must leave. You're bad for my business. And I felt like I'd encountered St. Francis of Assisi in the most unlikely spot at a collection of grouchy small business people in Central Square. And um, I also think that Joseph, Joseph's attitude suggests like an early step that people could take to not just create an atmosphere for successful restaurants, but to use food um, to generate um, more, hus more hospitality and conviviality among all the people who live and work and spend time in Cambridge. And I look forward to hearing people discuss this later. Thank you so much, Gus. This has been such an interesting series of presentations and I know that folks have a lot of questions. Um, I invite you to drop them in the chat and we will get to as many as possible. Um, I did have one that I wanted to start off with, and it I feel like all of our uh, speakers have touched on this to, it, to some extent or in some way. Um, but my question is the concept of um, authenticity, particularly when we're talking about new um, groups of immigrants coming to, or waves of immigration um, coming to the Cambridge area. And as Corky said, um, that quote from her early social worker journal that she uh, was researching about, you know, that the family was not assimilated, they were still eating spaghetti. Um, so how do we go from that at the turn of the 20th century to a real quest for authentic, food from other countries and who is the who becomes the the holder or the judge the gatekeeper of that authenticity and what does it mean is it the closer you are to um being born or raised in a particular country are you the holder of of authenticity or what happens when foodways change um when a population has been say in cambridge for several generations and and how do we navigate that so i'm, I'm curious i'm going to open it up to anyone who feels compelled to answer It's a really tough one. I teach about this question, or at least we open up the question of what, who owns a food. Um, the authenticity question, and I usually put it in great big scare quotes rather than just say it. But, um, you, know, you know, my students always say to me, where can I get authentic Japanese food or real sushi? And they all know by now that American sushi is not real sushi. But um, I, I think that there's also a much more political question as opposed to cultural definitions in a kind of scholarly. And that's about cultural appropriation that is kind of a tricky one. Um, um, particularly um, in the presentation of food. Yeah, I mean, if you, 
if you want something that's close to the way it might have been in the home country a hundred years ago, you are probably looking at, uh, a, you know, in the case of Italy, la cucina povera, really poor people's food. Um, that is beans and pasta, perhaps, uh, very basic. But, um, you know, that isn't what the North End sells now as Italian. Um, so it's, it's, and then there's the hyphenated question, does it become Italian American? And then what does that mean? Is it about ingredients? Is it about technique? Is it about service? It, it's, Beth, it's the biggest question <laughs> that you could have possibly raised. So, um, but I think the political issue is one that I hope isn't the prominent one, but more the historical and you know personal definitional. I usually tell my students, by the way, um, if it is your grandmother who is saying, my version is the authentic version, you let her have it. That's it. It is, you know. So you never, you never counter, you counter your grandmother. That's that's my basic message. Yeah, I think in Chinese. I mean, just oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. In Chinese food with my mom, it was it was hard because I mean, China is a big area. You'll have the same dish, but it's cooked differently in different different areas of China. So what is authentic? And um, I think that, again, it's one of those hard things is getting people to actually try it. And unfortunately, what I see is happening in Asian restaurants is they become like pan-Asian. Uh, you know, you're talking about sushi. I mean, rest, Chinese restaurants are now offering sushi on their menu. Uh, they're, unfortunately, they're kind of gaining away from the authenticity and going towards what actually they feel sells. Because you know the restaurant business is a tough business, the margins are very slow, uh, very small, and you really need to kind of, uh, unfortunately, kind of cater to what people want. Or, uh, but I think you know social media, I think the uh, cooking shows, Food Network, uh, those are the things that are really kind of educating people on different types of cuisine. And you know, if people can, because back in the fifties, there was no such thing as, as that. I mean, back in the 50s, when my mom first, I remember in our area near Fresh Pond, there was always the standalone restaurants, you know, Fantasia's restaurant, yeah. uh, River uh, a Reservoir restaurant uh, that was there until I think maybe the late 50s, uh, Homestead, <laughs> Howard Johnson's. I mean, they were all the, uh, you know, standalone uh, buildings and they were big buildings. Uh, that held a lot of people, where you couldn't do that in, in Cambridge. And, you know, of course, immigration is a big part of it. People who, uh, and also just the diverse population. I mean, as someone was saying, you know, because of a Korean church, you'll see more Korean restaurants, because it's catering towards the uh, population who knows the food and appreciates the, uh, the food. And then hopefully, people, someone will walk in and say, I'll try this. And hey, that's pretty good. And then they'll kind of get alchemated and tell their friends about it. So word of mouth, social media, I think is is kind of uh, the important part of it. I'm done. I just wanted to add a, a bit that was, um, I didn't talk about in the slides is that there was a restaurant um, in uh, Central Square that was called Imperial Restaurant. And it was, as far as I can see, the first Chinese restaurant there. Uh, and it was owned by a Chinese person and a not Chinese person who were in partnership together. And when it opened, it was a really big deal. And the mayor of Cambridge actually came to the opening dinner. Um, it was that special, right? Um, but very quickly the partnership fell apart and the not Chinese person <gasps> kept the restaurant, which is an interesting um, twist. So it remained a Chinese restaurant with those big square quotes. <gasps> Um, but really an American, an American phenomenon, right? And I think that sometimes it's, it's more useful to think of these things as, um, uh, you know, think of the phenomenon rather than is it, is it authentic to studies culture? Is it, you know, what, what's happening in that moment? What's mixing and being received? You know, what does the answer for this, this stuff? Yeah, well, that restaurant probably opened before because we opened our... Joyce Chin Small Eating Place in uh, 
1967. So right. Yeah, this was in 19, I think it actually opened in 1916 and it was on that map in, yeah. <laughs> in my 1920 map. Yeah, so really early, right? It was part of the chop suey craze, which was a, yeah, a big deal in the 1920s. It was very restrictive for, uh, for, yes. for uh, immigrants. You know, it wasn't yeah. immigration <laughs> started after, uh, you know, Kennedy administration. There was a lot of restrictions. And then, uh, of course, more students. I mean, my mother came to Harvard and MIT because of the Asian student, uh, population that she knew. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of everything. Wow. You know, I, I think, that, Stephen, I remember that when you and I were talking another time, we, we talked about some, a phenomenon that was called Boston Chinese food. And that this, the, this been writ, it's been written up. And I collected some um, quotes from, you know, people who had left Boston and maybe moved to Florida after they retired or something. And they kept saying, oh, I miss Boston Chinese food because the Chinese food of Florida is not Boston Chinese. And it had things like pork fried rice. I mean, that was seen as the Boston food. So it's a thing unto itself. It isn't, you know, fusion or or as one person wrote in the chat, it isn't bastardized authentic Chinese, it's Boston Chinese. It's something on its own. The way, you know, a lot of Chinese American food, yeah, it, it became a separate thing. Uh, like those, uh, those sushi that are American sushi and are sometimes sold in Japan as American sushi. You know, I mean, it's a different thing. That's all. Yeah, yeah. it's like opening a Taco Bell in Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or Benny Hanna. You know the story of Benny Hanna, Rocky Aoki, who created Benny Hanna of Tokyo in America, found that Japanese tourists coming to New York and seeing it said, Oh, they, they love this exotic American food that was being served at Benny Hanna. And so when he, he got smart and he created Benny Hanna of New York in Tokyo as an American, you know, outpost. Yeah. Yeah. So Again, it, it, it kind of based itself on kind of being authentic, but then it kind of is morphed into something different. It's a flow. Yeah. So I will go to a question that we have in the chat. Um, what do we do to encourage more small, small businesses and unique independent food restaurants to come to Harvard Square? I don't know if this was directly inspired by Gus's discussion of the proliferation of Starbucks in Harvard Square, but um, I'll open that up to anyone who feels like they want to tackle it. I think Gus might just talk. Well, People always, people always seem to want Cambridge or Harvard Square um, to return to s something that they remember. But you have to ask them, what time do you want to go back? But I certainly think, having lived in Cambridge a fairly long time, that um, Harvard Square has been transformed into something very dull. And a lot of it is due, I think, to real estate and zoning issues that... Um, when I've traveled to other places, I've seen uh, real estate developments that I think will create many more opportunities for the sort of small businesses that cannot afford ground floor first class re retail spaces. Um, in some big cities, um, you would see you could see restaurants or bars on the fifth or sixth floor. Um, there's really not much of a reason for them to be on the ground floor. Um, even American cities used to have a lot of underground facilities, chiefly bowling alleys and things like that. Um, Davis Square has several underground places that have been turned into theaters. Um, I think that some of the new developments in Harvard Square could have been encouraged or pressured um, to um, bring in certain kinds of uh, retail activity that would be sympathetic to what people want when they think about um, when they think about Harvard Square as a center of community activity and energy. So I think it's a zoning issue and um, kind of a political issue. Yeah, can, can I just add, because I also think, because you know, we had a restaurant in Cambridge and uh, on Mass Avenue in Central Square, and a lot of those locations were not built to be restaurants. Mm -hmm. 
storefronts, you had the problem with one of the big problems with sewage. You know, the sewage situation in Central Square, the sewer lines are centuries year old. I had opportunity to actually to look down and see the sewage. And I'll tell you, it was, I think at one time there was like a, a dam of grease that was blocking the sewage and they had to actually go there and break up that dam because of the restaurants. And now with, you know, the new uh, laws, you know, you need uh, grease traps and, and things like that. It's, it's really expensive and hard to open a restaurant than just cook, just to maintain the sewage, the ventilation, the grease that comes from, uh, from the vent ventilations, the smell. There's a lot of restrictions now. I think that's true, but um, I, I, a kind of countervailing observation I'd make is you probably cannot turn Cambridge back to like 1972, when in addition to all those ice cream stories, there were music stores on every corner in Cambridge selling records. Um, music technology has, has gone off in different directions, and there's no longer that kind of in-person market. Um, where everybody in Eastern New England is going to come in to Harvard Square to see if they can save 75 cents on the new Simon and Garfunkel album. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen anymore. And I think part of Harvard Square's problem is that it lost, music was the focus of the square for kind of a wonderful 10-year period. And that's changed completely. It's gone. And um, books are in, in danger of going in similar directions. Um, Harvard Square had many more bookstores than it does now. And a lot of them were specialty bookstores. And I think it would not be um, a bad idea to see if um, a big development like uh, Harvard, Square's, Harvard University's reconstruction of Holyoke Center might not have found places for Harvard University Press, which used to have a bookstore in the old Holyoke Center, St. Thomas More Bookstore, which sold religious books. There were architecture bookstores. There was Asia Books on Bow and Arrow Street that sold books about Asia. Um, Schoenhoff sold books in foreign languages. All those things are gone. And instead we have, um, we're going to end up with uh, more Bally shoe outlets, um, which will sell expensive shoes to the visiting parents of foreign students who attend Harvard. And I think that's, that's a civic loss. Yeah, I think a lot of the smaller restaurants are started by new immigrants uh <clears throat> it makes the this is kind of you know creating their own jobs they have their own families working but again the rents the uh just the investment into a restaurant is just really prohibitive now uh, mm -hmm. you're looking at restaurants that are now run by corporations i mean like just like you said the bookstores they would have independent bookstores but now you have you know you have Barnes and Nobos, and uh, you have those type of large corporations that kind of have chains. And, uh, you know, I, I look at Harvard Square now, compared back to the 50s or 60s, as being just like another big shopping mall. Yeah, and I think that um, you probably could have more creative urban design and planning um, could have resulted in something that would make almost everybody happier. But it might not have resulted in the kind of simple maximum profits um, that people who come out of the MIT real estate program um, seem to be looking for. And I think maybe instead of studying what's being taught at the Harvard School of Design and, and MIT's um, School of Architecture, we should pay attention to what's being taught at the MIT real estate school. The president of Harvard's a graduate of uh, the MIT real estate school. <clears throat> That was interesting because we also had a restaurant on 500 Memorial Drive. Mm -hmm. It was before the old Smith House, yep. which held 500 people. And the reason why, and we actually were, uh, the landlord was MIT for that restaurant. And, but I think, you know, we knew that the restaurant was eventually be torn down for dorms. So uh, my mother really kind of uh, got an architect from MIT <clears throat> and rather than trying to remodel the whole building, I don't know if any people remember, but it was painted really kind of crazy colors, you know, blues and reds and yellows. Mm -hmm. and just kind of to, uh, you know, basically the paint job was to make the, the, the restaurant look very different. So it, it was very different and was there for seven years. 
And I think at that time, rent was only about less than 2000 a, a month. I just want to jump in real quick because we do have some other uh, questions in the chat and I want to try to get to as many as possible. Um, Paul is saying, um, she said, there wasn't social media when the two JCs launched. It was PBS. Both ladies had such delightful personalities. Stephen, your mom was just so charming. Could you and maybe Mary speak about the influence of how people were drawn to the personalities and how it influenced people to broaden their food vocabularies? Well, uh, number one is my, my mother was, I mean, she really loved the customers. She would be there every night. She would wear her traditional Chinese dress and she would always give out uh, snacks to the kids, either fortune cookies. When we first opened, she used to give every kid a Tootsie Roll Pop. <laughs> so she really knew how to kind of, uh, and people were, were really ecstatic to meet someone who was a celebrity to them. Uh, from TV, and that really kind of brought people from all over the world, all over the country to the restaurant. And she just loved talking to those people, and they loved seeing her and talking to her too. Stephen, do you remember when um, there were there were Chinese herbal doctors in in the restaurant helping people to choose a menu that suited whatever was ailing them? Do you remember that? Uh, I, I've heard of that. And I think, wasn't Legal Seafood doing something like that? Yeah, I thought, I thought you were doing it as well. It's possible. I mean, my mom did a lot of it, like stretchy noodles. Serving, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the pecan ravioli or the, uh, the dragon buns back in the 60s. I mean, she was really doing a lot of stuff. There was a, a Chinese crawler, which was like a long donut. I remember yeah. she had to get a chef in from uh, Taiwan. Uh, and she told him to, you know, be sure you learn how to make that. <laughs> you come, And then that's why he was able to do that. And then, of course, I, you know, my mom actually um, applied about 30 chefs to come to America and with their families. And that's why you just see so many Chinese restaurants around. I remember at one time we had three Jewish restaurants in Cambridge, Fresh Pond, 500 Memorial Drive, along the river in Central Square. And we kept on saying, does Cambridge really need three Chinese restaurants? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess not. I guess they need more. <laughs> I guess there's a question on the chat that just came up about, you know, the, the closings of so many restaurants due to the pandemic. Um, what's going to come back or what kinds of new things might come. And I mean, this is something, you know, how, what I think is happening in answer to that is there's, there's young people now who are doing pop-ups everywhere. And the pop-ups are sometimes turning into brick and mortar. And those look, you know, that it's sort of like out of the rubble, something can happen. And I've been, you know, been really cheered by some of the new things. There's, there's uh, a new um, Vietnamese, interesting, interesting place on Prospect Street near Central um, called Cicada. Um, there's, there's, there's a, I think there is, there are young people filling in the gap and I hope that continues because they're independent and interesting and hardworking. And someone else is asking about food trucks. That's another way in which, you know, people can get a step up into the, into the world of food. And, and actually sometimes the food truck is the thing, you know, you don't, yeah, it starts it. Yeah. You, know, you don't, I mean, it's like the Kogi van in uh, LA that, you know, where the tacos are made with bull Kogi. I mean, there's all kinds of, I think, you know, opportunities. Um, so I don't know, what, what do the rest of you think about what's going to come? Well, you know, I, I've, I've, I know the people at Commonwealth Kitchen, who does, a lot, they have a commissary that does a lot of the food trucks. Right. You, um, sure. You know, and then eventually, if it's successful, they do either open a pop-up or eventually <coughs> their own restaurant. Uh, again, but unfortunately, I know MIT has an open space that they changed the restaurant um, 
uh, pop up every few months mm. uh, in Kindle Square. Um, but I've mostly seen some of the restaurants open in Dorchester. Uh, again, I, I think it really has to do with, unfortunately, with the rents. Just this, just the expense yeah. and getting the rent. I mean, even just to do a food truck, I mean, <laughs> it only costs almost costs eighty to one hundred thousand dollars to get a truck. Sure. You know, and then there's all the inspectors and all that. Yeah, and then it's really hard work because you start five o'clock in the morning. You have to prepare. Then after the food truck, you have to clean it up, and then you go back to commissary and you prepare uh, for the next day. It's it's yeah. really hard work. I think um, there's also, uh, there are also people who have had their restaurants closed. And I'm thinking of um, Iwakura Yoji, um, who had this wonderful downtown, you know, financial district, Kamakura restaurant. I don't know if anybody has been there. It was, it's unfortunately it had to close. It was the most fantastic Japanese restaurant. And um, but he's taken, he's bouncing back by doing pop-up kaiseki meals, which are really, really elaborate tea ceremony meals. And, you know, he's out of here and out of there and delivering them to your door and, you know, really working hard to get another, another nip place in, in, in the scene. Um, oh, yeah, somebody has just written about Bow Market. Uh, that's a very good incubator space. Yes. Um, yeah. So that that's another alternative too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, again, you just have to start out small. <laughs> yeah. So you can you know grow into something bigger. I it's mean, small, small. yeah. As you said, small means really working hard. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and it's getting your family to work hard too. <laughs> <laughs> that free labor. Yeah. Right. Which uh, we were all involved in. <laughs> We didn't get paid working in the restaurant. <laughs> and I think over time, expectations of what a restaurant is have changed so much. People really um, came to expect special experiences, and that's, that costs even more to provide. So I think people have to, for small, sort of friendly places to reemerge, people's expectations have to change. They and landlords' expectations have to change. Landlords can't expect that restaurants are going to make lots and lots of money as they did during the big, you know, the big restaurant boom in the 90s. It's, it's and, really a different scene and people have different, you know, now people have different understandings of food too. Having gone through a pandemic when everyone was cooking for themselves, people know a lot more about what it takes to make food. Um, so in some ways, their standards are going to be higher for the quality um, but really different for the the kind of sense of formality or informality that's provided. It's a whole really good point that we've changed. I I think the only meal that I really 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 wouldn't eat at home or get a takeout or make is dim sum. I mean, I need to be in Chinatown. I need to be at a dim sum place, preferably Hong Kong style with the carts going around. Yeah, if you can't replace that, so. That's one of the few that I think, you know, it just can't change for me. But. Yeah, no, it, it, it can't. It's, uh, yeah, I'm not really quite sure what's going to happen in, in the future. And of course, yeah. some of the restaurants closed because the uh, landlords aren't, aren't helping out in the rent. They're not willing to you know, reduce rent for a while or work out some type of agreement. And people are just seeing that, you know, it's, the pandemic and just you know they're they're working so hard and they're not getting yeah. anywhere. That's right, and no one can get uh, a lot of staff for any any kind of restaurants having trouble getting staff. Um, I see Polly wrote about Base Crave on here on Avenue. Yeah, um, that's pretty new. I think I've been there before the pandemic. It's Nepali Tibetan, and uh, it's it is very good. So there, there are some nice independent places, and you have, it's good to go be a chow hound and go sniff out, you know, different neighborhoods and see what's, you know, encourage people. So I'm saying, yeah, get out there and patronize the people who are trying so hard. Yeah, and you might, you know, discover a new gem. Yeah. That that brings me actually to something that 
I, I wanted to sneak in quickly before our time is up, which is the role of restaurants in Cambridge and um, and beyond during the pandemic. And I'm thinking particularly of the um, all of the healthcare workers that were pretty much sequestered and needing meals. Um, I know that Mount Auburn and certainly I'm sure other hospitals and, and um, workplaces were uh, bringing in meals that had to be all of course, individually wrapped and packaged and everything. But I know that the Cambridge um, Chamber of Commerce, I believe uh, employed some of the restaurants that were otherwise closed to make, uh, to prepare and deliver some of those meals and I'm just wondering sort of how that kind of bridges the gap between um, or the, the, the split between workplace and passion and sort of how, because I know it was really meaningful for some of those folks to not just be able to earn a paycheck or, you know, um, make a living doing, doing that restaurant work for the healthcare workers, but really to share their passion of, of cooking and, and sharing food. So I'm wondering if any of you could speak to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one other thing, because of the supply chain situation, I heard that some restaurants are having a really difficult time getting takeout containers. And uh, yeah. there's some restaurants now that are actually do, charging a surcharge because of the expense of uh, takeout containers. And I also, I think I heard that, you know, people say, well, why don't they bring their own containers, the customers? But I think there's a law against bringing your own container to take food out from a restaurant. Uh, I don't know if it's a regional law or a town law, but I think there's like a sanitation. It's just like going to a buffet, you can't use the same plate that you used when you ate the buffet and take it back to use it. So I, I, I don't know, but I mean the, yeah, I mean, that's, that's another situation. I think, uh, you know, I'm always aware of these different, how everything affects everything else. And I, I think that, you know, this whole takeout containers, all this plastic is, is something's got to, that, that has to be figured out. You know. <laughs> well, I feel like we are so close to 8.30 and this is a good time to wrap up, but I want to thank all of our speakers. It was wonderful hearing from you. I loved all the variety um, and all the experiences that you all shared. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming out this evening or coming in in your jammies um, and, and sharing some time with us. Um, thank you especially to uh, our sponsors and those who made donations. And please do look for that link tomorrow um, in your email to the survey. We really would love to hear um, what you love, what we could improve for next time. We're always trying to um, make our programs better, more relevant, and more engaging. So we really appreciate all of your time and effort. And thank you all so much. Yeah.